<laughs> okay. Hello, I'm nervous. Uh, I was told that I, I really wanted to bring something for everybody, but I was told that I was not allowed to bring durian in here. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Patterson, uh, and I have come from the United States to bring you freedom. <laughs> I usually like to give a talk at the beginning of the conference if I can, because I assume that like, if I do extremely poorly, at least it happened at the beginning of the conference and everyone will have forgotten by the end of the conference. But today I'm giving the very, very last talk, so that kind of made me nervous. And then I realized something that I, I'm giving the last talk, and right now I'm the only thing that's between you and beer. So... <laughs> It doesn't matter. Oh, I'm still on mute. Am I on mute? Ah, sorry. Oh, unmute. Hello. Is that better? No? Hello? On mute. Oh, it's, it's off. <laughs> oh. Is it on now? Now, now we're on. Wow. Much better. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. So, I am the only thing that is between you and beer, and I also figure that once we have go to the after party, hopefully after a few beers, you will have forgotten everything that I say. So, it'll be fine. I'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> at least I tell myself that. Uh, I work for Red Hat. Um, I am on the Manage IQ team at Red Hat, and we manage clouds. So if you have a cloud, we can manage your cloud. <laughs> that is what we do. That is what our team does. So if you happen to have one, we will manage it for you. Um, on the team, I, my job title is Hacker Man. Uh, that's... <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Uh, so I'm on the Ruby core team, I'm also on the Rails core team, and I'm a pro Neko Atsume player. So I've gone pro, <laughs> pro at this game. This is a, this is a picture of my, my setup. Uh, I really want to say thank you to all the organizers here. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Give yourselves a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is an awesome conference. I feel really privileged to be here for the third time. It's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about my experiences here on this trip. Uh, so I, I just want to, you know, talk a little bit about the stuff that's happened to me while I'm in Singapore. Uh, I had to endure in the heat. <laughs> I ate a lox of food. <laughs> I took many selfies, so these are, these are all of my selfies, um, <laughs> more selfies, selfies with mats. Um, I took over, or, over 200 selfies and wefies, and I plan to do more of that after this, after this talk is over. <laughs> Uh, so, some of the stuff that I learned, I want to talk a little bit about some of the presentations I saw here. Uh, I learned that Ruby Motion is not PhoneGap. So. <laughs> uh, science is scientific. Uh, <laughs> Rails is not omakase, <laughs> which uh, I'm actually. I'm really glad to hear about this, that it's not omakase, because once I heard that, it ruined sushi for me. <laughs> uh, then I, like, everybody was doing Richard Stallman stuff, so I decided to Google awkward Richard Stallman, so that's, that's what I found when I looked for that. Uh, I learned that refinements need more refinement. <laughs> So there have been, there've been a lot of really, really awesome talks here today. So what I'm really, what I'm really trying to say here uh, while you watch my presentation is that you should lower your expectations, please. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I gotta, I'm going to apologize up front. I really got to apologize up front because uh, all the stuff that I'm going to present to you today is like, it's all very, very technical stuff. Like, most of the stuff we're going to talk about is very tech, numbers, heavy things. And I'm afraid that it, the content might be, might be very boring. It might even be super dry. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, welcome, welcome to my talk. You may have noticed I'm trying to use, so I'm trying to use in all the slides a Baskerville font. Uh, and the reason that I'm doing this is because I read online that uh, stuff in Baskerville, if it's written in Baskerville, it's more believable. So I'm not making this up. You can go to that URL and read about it. So I wanted, I wanted people to believe the things that I have to say. <laughs> uh, and then I just decided I should put in a picture that I like, which is this picture. I, I saw that on the internet. And I just wanted to share it. Uh, <laughs> that's it. It's just a picture I like. <laughs> um, all right, so I've got, a, I've got a couple cats. This one, this is one of my cats. Her name is Choo Choo or uh, CTAC, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Airport is her full name. Uh, and this is Gorbachev, or Gorby Puff Puff Thunder Horse. And I actually have stickers of him. So if you want a sticker of my cat, come say hello to me, and I will give you a sticker of my cat. Um, and if you want to know how I got these cats, like I, I, I'm going to explain that. Basically, this is the process. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you want a cat like mine. <laughs> uh, I, I also like extremely strange keyboards, too. I have built, like, one of my hobbies is to build keyboards. I love building keyboards. This is one of my keyboards. I have it with me today. So if you want to check it out, I'll tell you all about that, and we can talk about strange keyboards. Um, and my cats love them, too. This is another one of my keyboards at home, and they like to sit on it. That's Choo Choo, and then Gorbachev also likes it. It's really convenient while I'm programming. It's right there, like, helping me out, right? <laughs> This is my other one, uh, Choo Choo with my other keyboard. Uh, recently, well, I guess last December, my wife and I decided to get some uh, uh, photos taken, professional photos taken, and I wanted to share them with you. These are supposed to be for holiday cards. This is my <laughs> wife and I. <laughs> this, is a, this is another one of me. I'm not sure, so I'm not sure if I actually am supposed to own, show these, because I don't, I don't actually own the copyright on them, and I'll explain that to you over some beers. Uh, it's, not, it's an interesting story, it's slightly interesting. Uh, and this is another picture of my cat, just for fun. Um, I'm really into extreme programming. So I love, I love XP, really love XP. And when I was at RailsConf, I got the opportunity to meet Kent Beck, which is really awesome. This is, he took a photo with me. It was really, <laughs> it was really cool of him. Uh, now we're best friends forever. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, like he and I, while we were being best friends, we worked on a, we collaborated together on an extreme programming uh, setup, and I have been prototyping it at my apartment, and this is the extreme setup, <laughs> so that you don't get hurt while you are extreme programming. Anyway, so uh, the title of my talk, you, you might have read in the, in the program, the title of my talk was Code Required, but actually the real title of my talk is uh, everything you ever want to know about loading files but were afraid to ask, or maybe you didn't really want to know about it anyway, but you're here just because. And then they told me that was too long for the program. They couldn't fit it, so I had to give them a short name. So this is called Code Required. Uh, and I also put in an emoji. <laughs> <laughs> so I want, to talk, I, I want to talk a little bit about security. Uh, this isn't the main thing, main part of the topic, but we're covering other stuff that, you know, other talks here. Andre talked about security, and I want to talk, tell a little bit, a little story about uh, security stuff, a little security mistake that I made. Uh, and <laughs> oh, this story sucks. Uh, so this is, I learned this command. You don't need to do this command today. If you're on a newer Git, you don't need to do this one. Uh, but this is a really, really important command that you should, you needed to learn earlier. Uh, so 
I'm on the security team, the Rails security team, and I deal with security issues that come up from time to time. And basically, the way that I handle those is, or the way that we handle those, or my personal way that I handle it is, we have a branch. I'll have a branch that's like, you know, we got the 3.2, 3.2 stable branch, and that's the one that's up on GitHub. And you know, just for example, there's all the other ones, the stable branches as well, right? And then I have a, on my local machine, I've got a 3.2 sec branch, and I'll do that for each of the branches that we're maintaining. And I keep that branch on my machine until it's time to actually uh, do the release, right? When it's time to do the release, I'll merge those back into the stable branch and then push those up to GitHub. Anyway, so I, I had done, been working on some security stuff, and it was time, you know, Good, we're gonna do the release the next day. Everything was going fine. And I, so I decided, like, we had planned on doing the release the following day, so I was like, well, I'll just do some, like, bug fixes now or whatever, you know, just go about my work, because we got that done. So, you know, I'm working against master, and I decide, okay, I'm gonna do a, you know, fix a bug, do a commit, so I do that, do a commit. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna do git push. And then as soon as I did git push, that happened. And all of the security patches were posted to GitHub a day early. And then I learned how to delete branches on GitHub very quickly. So uh, to fix this problem, you use that command that I showed earlier. And I wanted to find, so I was thinking I should find this, I should find what happened, like the campfire conversation, what happened when this, you know, when I did this. Uh, so I searched campfire for this. And uh, I couldn't find anything. There were way too many, there were way too many uh, records in there. So anyway, after that, I learned how to delete branches on the remote on GitHub. I did that very quickly. And then I tweeted this. Um, and everybody thought, wow, that's a very handy command. I should use that too. And I was actually just face bombing the entire time. Why didn't I do this earlier? Anyway, so the moral of the story is that security is not fun. Um, and don't do open source. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm kidding about the don't do open source part. Security is not fun. It's, it's just not fun. <laughs> All right, so I'm on the Rails team, and I spend a lot of time thinking about Rails performance. I like working on Rails performance, but a lot of the time, like, I think a lot about boot time. Like, uh, our application at work, our application is actually open source. You can go to our GitHub. I, don't, I should have put the URL in here, but you can go to our GitHub, the Manage IQ GitHub, and actually look at our repository. So you can see what's happening there. Uh, and our app looks a little bit something like this. We have over 500 models, 83 controllers. Uh, these, this is just the numbers from Rake Stats, so I don't know if it's totally accurate. Uh, our boot time is like 12 seconds. And the way that I'm measuring boot time for this purpose is just, just like this. I'm running Rails Runner and just printing out the version. So it takes about 12 seconds to do that. And a lot of the time spent in our application is loading files. So I'm thinking about how can we load files faster. So that is, that's the stuff that I've just been working on recently. And that's really what this presentation is about, is things I've been working on recently. So before we get into how to make this faster, I want to talk about what it does today, uh, and then we'll talk about usage, usage of loading files, how people use it, uh, and then we'll talk about speeding it up. So first, let's talk about how files are loaded. So we're going to look at three functions. We're going to look at load, require, and autoload. And in order to talk about these functions, we need to know of, about a few global variables. And you probably know about these variables already. So we'll look at these variables as the load path. We have dollar $load path. That's our first global variable. And it's just a list. Uh, and you can modify the list. You can modify it by just saying unshift. Or you can use dash i and mutate it. So you can actually say, like, I'll run with, you know, I'll run dash i, hello. And you'll see that at the top there, you added that to your um, added that to the load path if you print it out. Now, you can think of the load path as essentially our code database, our code to load database. When we want to look up, when we want to find some code, you say require foo, that's where we're going to go look for it. That database is the load, uh, the load path. Now, the other global variable we need to know about is loaded features. This is, this is the other global variable. This is our code that has been loaded. This is just a list. Uh, with a caveat that it's not just a list. 
Uh, it looks like a list to us Ruby programmers. If you print out the global variable, it's just a list. But uh, under the hood, inside of MRI, there's actually a cache uh, hash of that, so we can do lookups faster. Uh, so it's not just a list under the hood, but to us it is. Uh, this is our already loaded code database. This is the code that we've already loaded. So you know when you require a file twice, it's not going to be loaded twice. So if we, need to find, if we need to find code, we look in the load path. And if we need to test whether or not code has been loaded, we look in loaded features. So those are our main, main players when we're trying to look up files to load. All right, so our first function to look at is load. This is a function for loading a file. It takes a file name, and it also takes this wrap uh, option, and we'll talk about that later. You can give it a full path. So you say load, full path. And if we run that code, so we load up test twice, or test will load x.rb twice. When we run that, you'll see it actually loads the file twice. It just takes whatever code is in that file and just executes that thing. We can also give it a, very, or a relative path, so you can just say load x.rb. And in that case, it will search the, uh, search the load path and uh, load those to find those files. So if we run it, you'll see uh, the output is hello world twice. And you'll also notice that I had to provide a dash i, the temp, so that it knew where to find x.rb. So that searches the load path. But it only searches the load path if you provide a file that's not an absolute path. Now, this, this, very, or this option is interesting, the wrap option. How many of you have used this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so you can provide a true, you can say load true. Now, let's actually, I don't want to spoil the surprise. Sorry. Let's look at this. This is our usage of it. We'll say load x.rb, and we can print out x, the class. And on the right-hand side there, we'll print out the name of the class. OK, and if we run this, we'll see it looks exactly what you'd expect. It prints out the string x, because that's the name of the class. And then it just prints out x again, because that's the class that was defined. Now, if we add true, if we add true, what will happen is Ruby will actually evaluate that code inside of an anonymous module. So if we execute that, say, this program, we'll see the output is, OK, module blah, 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 x and then uninitialized constant x. which is, It's kind of interesting. So you can actually load some code inside of an anonymous module. If you want to, I think this would be interesting, like let's say maybe you want to load two versions of the same library inside of an anonymous module. I think it might be interesting. However, you can't get access to that anonymous module outside of the load. The caller can't get access to that. The other interesting problem with this is that Let's say we have uh, this setup here where test loads x and then x loads y. So this evaluates that file and then comes down and evaluates this file. So we print out the names of each of those. So when we execute this program, we expect the first thing to be output is uh, that name and then that name. So we expect y to come out first and then x to come out second. So does anyone know what the output of this will be? Anyone? Probably not, since nobody used the true <laughs> value. <laughs> the output will be this. We, you might think that both of those would be wrapped in the anonymous module, but it's not. Actually, y will be divine, defined at the top level, and then x will be defined in the, uh, inside the anonymous module. So my question is, is this actually very useful? And I talked to Matt about this earlier, and he was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody uses this. So the answer is, uh. <laughs> so it seems to me like we should probably wrap everything, wrap everything, or somehow give a module or something to that variable, say wrap it in this module, or remove the feature. I'm not sure what we would use that for otherwise. Although since nobody's using it, it doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so load, to recap load, load searches the load path, but it doesn't, do, it doesn't have any interaction with loaded features. It doesn't have any interaction with that global variable at all, only the load path one. We saw that when we gave a relative file name. Now, if we look at require, let's have another example. We can give require a full path, so we'll do require twice. In that second file, x over there will print out hello world. And if we execute this program, just as you'd expect, Hello world is only output once. We've all used require. We all know about the semantics. It'll only load that file once. 
We can also give a relative path to require, so like this. When we execute that, again, hello world is printed out, and you'll notice that I had to specify slash temp to dash i so that it knew where to find that file. What else is kind of cool about require is requ require will return a Boolean to you about whether or not that file was loaded. So when we run it the first time, it'll say true, meaning yes, I did load something. I loaded some, I loaded some code. The second time, it'll say I didn't load any code. False is I didn't load any code. So in order to do that, it has to search loaded features to figure out whether or not it already loaded that code. So this is how our second global variable is used. So we can, see, we can actually see that modification in action with this program right here. So we dupe the loaded features before we require, then print out the, the difference between uh, before and after. And if we look at that, we'll see, yes, indeed, it just it added that fully qualified path to the loaded features array. And you'll see, like, require is smart in that if we say require x and require x.rb, it'll canonicalize that file name and check the loaded features thing. So if we print that out, it'll have exactly the same output as a previous slide. Now, I keep mentioning canonicalization, and this is going to be important. The load path is used for canonicalization, right? So if you look at this, if you look at this example, on the left-hand side, we have the non-canonical format, and on the right-hand side, we have the canonical format, the canonical format being the entire path of the file. So Ruby knows, using, using the load path, how to figure out that whole file path and check the loaded features as to whether or not it's been loaded. So the, the logic for this looks, looks a little bit something like this. Is it, is it canonical? Ruby says, is it canonical? We say, no. Then it says, OK, we canonicalize it. And then we go back to, is it canonical? Yes. We check, is it loaded? Uh, if it is, isn't, then we load it, add it to the loaded features, and then we're done. If it's already been loaded, then we're done. So this canonicalization step right here is where the load path is used. And this is loaded part is where loaded features is used. And then if we actually load the code, loaded features is used again right there. Got it? It's just that simple. Those seven easy steps. <laughs> we all got it, yes, OK. <laughs> all right. So the next thing we're going to look at is autoload. And autoload auto load usage looks like this. We, have, we say, OK, I want to autoload some particular constant bar. And when that constant is referenced for, for the first time, I want you to load that constant from this particular file here. So bar, whenever anybody looks up bar, it'll look in file x for that thing. And then when we reference the constant bar, it'll go load this program. So as soon as bar is referenced, it'll load x.rb. That'll print out high. And then it'll go define bar, and we're done. So when we run this program, you'll see the output is just high. And then it's that constant foo bar. So this, the semantics of autoload are exactly the same as require in this particular case. So if we reference bar multiple times, it's not going to load the file multiple times. So if we execute this, you'll see high is printed out once, and then it just prints out the constant three times after that. So the autoload lo logic looks a little bit something like this. Did it, you know, if, when a constant is referenced, it says, did we load it already? Uh, if we didn't load it, then let's go do the require logic, and then we're done. If we did load it, then we're done, right? So we do constant reference, evaluate this file, doot, and then execute the whole thing. So we know we put out hello. Now we get bar. And then as soon as bar is uh, uh, evaluate, ah, I think I said this already. Ah, I'm scared. <laughs> anyway, so when bar is referenced, x isn't necessarily evaluated. Now. The interesting thing is we have to say, like, when we get autoload, the autoload logic is a little bit more complicated. When we say, when we reference a constant, we have to say, well, ah, let me be a little bit more clear. When we're, re when we're evaluating this file, what actually happens is uh, we're referencing that constant twice, OK? We reference it once here in the foo bar, but then as soon as we're evaluating this file, it comes in and it prints out high, and then it references the constant a second time here right there. So what happens when that bit of code is executed? 
we know that we're referencing a constant a second time, and we have to say, well, we're currently loading this file. We don't want to reload it. If we reloaded it, we'd be into an infinite loop, right? So bar, when bar is referenced, x is not evaluated that second time. So our autoload logic is a little bit more complicated. We have to say, OK, did we load it? Are we currently loading it? Is it in flight? If we're not currently loading it, then we do the require logic. If we are currently loading it, then we have to say we're done. So we need, to, we need some, some mechanism for making sure that we're currently loading that particular file. So I'm going to get a little bit hand wavy here. Hand wavy, woo! <laughs> but what's going on under the hood is that we actually have a hidden global variable that isn't exposed to Ruby. There's a global variable inside of Ruby that keeps track of the files that we're currently requiring, the files that we're currently loading, and that's called the loading table. And if you look inside, if you look inside a MRI source, you'll find this function called get loading table. And this is the thing that keeps track of files that are currently being loaded. So file load steps, when we looked at the file load steps like this, right here at this load section, that's the part where we actually add to that add to that in-flight list. So our load steps look a little bit something like this. We take out a lock. We add the file to the loading table that is not exposed to Ruby. You don't see this normally. We eval the file, add that to the loaded features, and then remove the lock and remove it from unloading, and we're done. So I want to talk, so far we've been looking at uh, functions that are just inside of Ruby. We haven't talked about RubyGems at all. And I want to talk a little bit about RubyGems and its relationship with Ruby's require. This is important for figuring out how we're going to speed up loading, loading stuff in Rails. So we hit, let's say we do require rack. We know that we've installed the rack gem. And when we do require rack, how does it know to find rack? So how, do, how does it know that we can look that up? Or where do we look that up? The way that it works is that RubyGems implements require. And if you look here, you'll say, like, if, to prove this, we can get a reference to the method and say, tell me where the source location is for that method. And you'll see there it's implemented somewhere inside of RubyGems. So on line 38 or whatever, right there. Now, if we run without RubyGems, so you can say disable gems and run IRB, you'll see uh, the method source location is nil. So right up there, disable gems means no Ruby gems whatsoever. And if we look for the source location of require, we'll see that it's nil. And that means that it's implemented in C. So if your methods are implemented in Ruby, you'll get a, you'll get a uh, source location for it. If it's implemented in C, you'll get nil. So how does Ruby gems as require work? I'm going to boil this down very simply. It looks like this. Basically, what it does is it aliases, the, aliases Ruby's require off to the side. Then it tries to call the original require. And if there is an exception, then it'll go look for any gems that have that particular file in it. Then it mutates the load path and then tries the require again. So I know that's a lot of code. The way that it works is we say, all right, try Ruby's require. If that works, great, we're done. We just return. If an exception happens, then we say, OK, go find a gem that contains that file. Then mutate the load path to put that gem's directory onto the load path. Then try the require again, and then we're done. So you can see when we do require on rack, that very first, that very first require is going to cause an exception. The second require will not have an exception because the gem is now put onto the load path. So this very first section here, we say, all right, require rack lock. We hit an exception, and we go all the way down through here, and we're done. That second one, the e tag one, just goes straight down to done because we're already on the load path. So there's actually a way to load rack without causing any exceptions in your process. If you do gem rack like this, the gem rack actually mutates the load path. All that does is it looks up the gem, mutates the load path, and then both of these have no exceptions. So to tie this together, we can see the exception in action if we run with dash D. If you run Ruby with the debug flag on, you can actually see all the exceptions that are occurring inside your app. Now, you can see right there, our first, we have one exception on rack lock, and the required rack e tag, it's fine. Doesn't matter anymore. We can also see this from uh, inside IRB. If we dupe the load path and then we require rack lock, you'll see down there at the bottom, that gem has been added to the load path. 
you'll also see that the loaded features are mutated at the same time. So, so far, we've looked at require, loading code with require, auto load, and load. Uh, we've looked at global variables, the global variables that are involved, load path, loaded features, and that hidden one that you don't see in RubyLand loading table. And we've also looked at RubyGems as require and how it mutates the load path. So the next thing that I want to look at are RubyGems usage and performance characteristics and performance improvements that we can do with RubyGems. So I want to know, and note that I'm saying Ruby space gems usage, I want to know about people's development environments. It's hard for me when I'm doing, when I'm doing development against Rails and trying to improve the development environment of Rails, it's difficult for me because I don't have access to all the applications that all of you are developing. I have, I have access to my application at work, so I use that for sure. Uh, and then maybe some other, other open source ones. But I don't know what the typical developer is like. What is the typical developer like? I don't know that. And that's the question that I want to answer is, what does a typical development environment look like? So I created a survey thing here. This is, this is the code. You can go visit it. You don't need to run it now, because I'm going to show you the results that I have from that. Uh, and hopefully, I'd like to get this thing running every year so we can see how development environments change. And the data that came back looks a bit like this. Uh, make sure to read all this. I'm going to quiz you on it later. <laughs> <laughs> so the data that I'm collecting, I think it's kind of interesting. Basically, all this gem does, it's not even a gem. It's just a script you run. All it does is collect some data about your environment and then post it to a Google form, and that goes into this, this document here. Uh, so the data that I'm collecting are like, how many gems do people use? Like, how many gems are installed on your system, like system-wide? Then how many gems are in your project? So I want to know like your Rails project, because the gems that you use in your Rails project are different than the ones that are installed globally on your system. Uh, how many files are in each gem? And what versions of Ruby gems do you use, and what versions of Ruby do you use? So the reason I want to know this data is because uh, gem count impacts your performance because it modifies that load path. That load path impacts our performance, and we'll see how that, how that uh, impacts our performance later. And the file count impacts our performance as well. The way that the number of files impacts our performance is how are we going to do caching? What is our caching strategy going to be? So the data specifically collected is gem count, and the gem count per project, and system-wide for that particular user. Uh, your Ruby version, your Ruby gems version, host OS, and the file counts for each of the gems that you have installed. Min, max, median, mean. But nothing specific about each of the gems. I also collected a unique user ID and a unique project ID. And I, I think it was an interesting thing that I did, so I'm going to share the code with you. The user ID, the unique user ID and project ID, uh, I put quotes around them because they're not necessarily unique. They could be duplicated. Basically, I generated a hash for that particular user. And this is what the code looks like for generating that hash. We just said, OK, give me your host name, your IP address, your time zone, and whatever your home directory is. Mash that together as a string, and then SHA-256 it and send it off. So that's our ID. So theoretically, two people who are running exactly the same setup like this could have sent duplicate results, but probably that's not true. So each project, I grab the, per project, I just grab your bundle gem file. Bundler actually sets an environment variable that points at your gem file, SHA that, and send it up. So duplicates are possible but unlikely. And also, this data is pretty anonymous. I don't know anything particular about anyone who submits data. So as far as the responses are concerned, I got 466 unique projects, 140 unique systems. And a lot of the data I'm going to present to you here today, I used R, the R programming language, to do processing on it. And after using R for a while, I can tell you that R is terrible. Uh, <laughs> It sucks. I wasted many hours on this. I would have been done way earlier if I had just stuck with Ruby. <laughs> and we'll talk about that over beers tonight. Please, come ask me. Ask me for a sticker and tell me about, uh, and I'll tell you about how R is terrible. Anyway, these are the versions that we looked at. So this is, a, this is just a version breakdown. We have, I think I had one response using 187, so that's kind of cool. Uh, you have to notice that, note that these 
uh, these statistics are totally biased because the way that I advertise this is through Twitter. So they're biased towards people who follow me on Twitter. Uh, they're also biased towards people who will actually send me some data. But I guess, you know, whatever. Those are the people who are going to get performance improvements. So good for them. <laughs> So our implementation system-wide, we had all I got were, the only responses I got were MRI and JRuby, and that's what the breakdown looks like. Uh, I think what was interesting about this is that uh, JRuby users are, I guess, running more projects. So a person running JRuby on their system has more projects uh, than usual. Um, another thing I thought was interesting was looking at RubyGems upgrades. Uh, it turns out, 44% of people have upgraded once. So 44% of the people who responded to me have upgraded their RubyGems system. And the way that I measured this is I looked at, I went through every version of Ruby and looked at the RubyGems that shipped with that version and then compared that to the RubyGems version that they told me they were running. So 44% have upgraded once and 23% 23, 23 are on the latest version, which I thought was interesting. Um, Looking at project distributions, so I wanted to know how many projects are on each machine. This is what the project distribution looked like. Most people are only running a couple projects, but there's a few that are running like almost 90 on one machine, right? So our summary looked a little bit like this. This is our max, our max output. We had 82 projects on one machine, so most people have like three at most. Our OS distribution looked like this. I had zero people with Windows respond to me. Uh, everyone is using OS 10 or Linux, and I'm trying to get, I think that this reflects development environments. We're trying to get development environment information because that's what I care about optimizing is your development environment. I don't really care about your production environment so much. I, I shouldn't say, don't quote me on that. <laughs> I do care about your produ production environment. <laughs> But I'm trying to optimize your development, your development environment. So our project distributions, what was interesting about project distributions, this is, I want to look at gem distributions per project. How many gems does your project depend on? And this isn't just the number of gems that are in your gem file. This is the entire, the entire graph, right? This is what it looked like. This is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not sure what type of graph that is. It is a graph. It is a keynote graph. I was going to say, oh, it's linear, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It's Keynote. Anyway, so this is, this is, here's a, the statistics about this. Our max, we had somebody with 287 gems. And most people are running about 100, 100 or so gems, which actually works with the project we have at work. Our, ours is a little bit on the higher side. I think we have about 200, 200 gems or so. But average is about 100 gem dependencies. File distribution, this is interesting. This is the number of files that RubyGems thinks are requirable in a particular gem, okay? Now, look at that. That is the number of files in each gem. That's not total across the project. That's each gem. So you'll notice on the very right-hand side there, there are gems that have 14,000 files in them. And those are requirable files. You can actually require all of them. So. <laughs> The average here is about 4,000 files. What I think is interesting about this is it means like there are 4,000 files that are potentially requirable inside of your project, but probably not all 4,000 of them are being required. System distribution, uh, number of gems on each system. This is interesting to me because the number of gems that are on your system will impact uh, bin, bin stubs, RubyGems bin stubs. So when you run bundle exec or bundle whatever, this number will impact that command. So that's why I wanted to know this. So we want to optimize your projects, and we also want to optimize your system. Summary looks like this. Uh, so this is the number of gems that are installed system-wide. One person responded had 1200, over 1,200 gems installed on their system, which is crazy. <laughs> so number of files, number of files per system. <laughs> what? Almost 90,000 files. <laughs> it's crazy. There's some really interesting data out here. 
So the average project, average project, just to summarize, the average project has about 100 gems, about 4,000 files. The average system has about three projects on it. 280 gems are typically installed on your system, and maybe 13,000 files are requirable. I think what this boils down to is that people typically, they're just installing the gems on their system, and then they go into their projects and they're doing bundle there. Right? So you're probably installing more gems on your system and then using those inside of your bundles. So performance characteristics, let, let's move on to the future. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the performance and how we're going to improve the performance. I wanted to know, as the number of gems grows, how does require change? So we see we have a range of projects here from very few gems up to many, many gems. Uh, how does the performance of require change if we change the number of gems that are on the system? So what I'm really saying here is, as the load path grows, how does retire, or require time grow? Because that's what we're, we're doing with gems. When we load the gems, we put them on the load path. Right? So what we're really talking about here is uh, search, load path search time. How long does it take to, to search the load path? Uh, and this is the test code that I used. Again, please read it. It's, you're going to be quizzed on it later. I know this is a small point font, but it is Baskerville. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the test code, a little zoomed in a little bit. Basically what I did is I said, okay, get, uh, get the clock time, the current clock time, require the, require the file, and then get the clock time afterwards. And I, if you can read this code, great. If not, I'm going to be posting the slides later. But what I think is cool about this is we can get uh, Ruby exposes a high resolution clock to us that's also monotonic. Monotonic meaning uh, if the system clock changes, that doesn't impact our, impact our tests. So what I did is I said, okay, we're going to increase the load path and we're going to require one file. And we're going to do a worst case scenario file and a best case scenario file and we're going to graph that time. And this is what the graph looks like. So the red one is our, our worst case scenario, that's the worst case file. And the blue one is our best case, the fastest one. So as you can see here, uh, down, along the, down along the x-axis there, that's the number of gems we have activated. So that's roughly the size of the load path. And the y-axis is require time in milliseconds. So how many milliseconds it took to require that one file. So you can see here we scale linearly. As the size of the load path increases, the amount of time it takes to require also increases. So we see, like, when I say worst case, what does that mean? Well, when we do, like, let's say we have a load path here and we're looking for foo, the worst case means we go in here and we say, oh, it's not there, it's not there, it's not there, it's all the way at the end, and we found it. Now, best case scenario means it's at the beginning. We found it at the very beginning. It's there. We're done. So what I think is really interesting about this graph, and it's a question that I don't have an answer for today, if it's at the beginning of that list, it should be constant time. It should always be the same speed. We know it's at the beginning, we're done. Every single time, yet you can see here it actually increases linearly. So I think this is a bug. I don't know what the bug is yet. I don't know why it does this. It's something I need to study a bit more, and I can tell you when I was producing these graphs, I was crying. <laughs> because I was hoping I could come in here and say to you, oh, it's linear time, everything's great, but this is the reality. So at 300 gems, you have, it takes four to six milliseconds to require one empty file. This is an empty file. And you think, wow, four to six milliseconds, it's actually pretty fast. But then when you think, oh, wait, my app has 3,000 files in it. So six milliseconds times 3,000 files adds up, right? So let's look at some performance improvements. What I want to do is we have this load pass search, and that load pass search is ON, and I want to change it to O1. I want to do constant time, constant time lookups. I want to have constant time requires. So searching load path is ON. And the reason searching load path is ON, or we have to search load path because we keep mutating it. Now searching that is, you know, searching that is ON. And I think, well, okay, how can we improve the performance here? I think the way that we can improve performance is, you know, what if we just stopped searching the load path? Eh? <laughs> Let's just stop doing it. Just don't do it anymore. So how can we do that? The way we do that is if you provide a full path name to require, if you provide a full path name, that doesn't search the load path anymore. 
So if you do something like this, we say, okay, require foobar baz.rb, that doesn't search the load path, and we can have a constant time require in that case. But the question is, how can we accomplish this? You don't want to write out slash foobar baz on your system, because you're shipping that code out to somebody, and they might be on an, in a different place, and also that's a pain to write, and we write Ruby for fun, and writing out the entire thing like that is not fun, and why are you making me write out all this stuff? This is really terrible. So what we need to talk about is canonicalization. We talked about it a little bit earlier. It happens in two places. It happens when we search the load path, and it also happens when we search gem specs. What's interesting is when you say require foo, like what Ruby does is it says, okay, I'm gonna go look for foo.rb, I'm gonna go look for foo.so or foo.o, uh, or just plain foo, maybe there's a file named just foo. I'm gonna look for that file in all of those directories in the load path. What's interesting is the logic for Ruby gems is require, and the logic for, this is a little side thing here I found while I was researching this data, is the logic for Ruby gems and the logic for Ruby are different, unfortunately. So this is, this is uh, using um, just uh, Ruby gems. So we say require nokugiri.bundle, and that works. Require nokugiri.so, that works. Actually, no, I'm sorry, this is plain old Ruby. Now, if we use that same code with Ruby gems, it just breaks. This is my life, what I do every day for all of you. <laughs> so maybe I will have two beers tonight. <laughs> anyway, you're getting off track. Yes, yes, I am. Okay, back to this. You say require foo, and it calculates all these, it tries to find all these things. We have a require parameter, and it goes from the require parameter to the file name. Right? But what if we went backwards? What if we went backwards from that? We know what the files are it's going to look for. We can say, like, okay, well, given a particular full file path, we can predict what, what the parameter to require will be. We know it'll either be foo.rb, or it'll be foo, or it'll be the entire path. We know this data in advance. We don't need to do this at runtime. So the idea is we could put together a translation hash. We could say, all right, let's put together a hash that says it has foo.rb and foo in it and all of those point at lib foo. Then we can change our Ruby gems as require to instead of looking like this, where we have on here, on here, and on here, instead what we do is we look up that parameter inside that hash and we actually end up with constant times on that two, those two first steps will be constant time. All right, so I put together a little uh, proof of concept for this. I uh, ran the code, exactly the same benchmarks I showed you before, except that uh, this time we're looking up that file in a hash, rather than scanning the entire file system, or scanning everything in the load path, and this is what the graph looks like. We say, all right, down there along the, the x-axis is the number of gems that I've activated. So on the very right-hand side, I've activated 1,000 gems. And on the y-axis there is uh, time in milliseconds to require one file. And you can see it's a linear time there. And what I think is really, really cool about this is that uh, it's less than one millisecond. I actually had to change my test. If you look at my test, it says, OK, time this and time it in milliseconds. And it was always returning one. So I actually had to measure in nanoseconds, which was fun. Uh, but anyway, if we, when can we do this? When can we calculate this cache? We know about this cache on gem install. So as soon as somebody installs a gem, we can look at all those files and say, OK, here are all the files that they installed. Let's calculate those short names for it, put that in a hash, and then when you run your program, we can actually use that hash. Now, astute watchers those of you who are still awake and not mad at me because you want beer, <laughs> will note that there are challenges with this. And I want to talk a little bit about the challenges with this that I'm trying to overcome. First off, we have to deal with dash i. People can run, I showed this at the very beginning, people can run with dash i. And dash i takes precedence over gems. If you run with dash i, you want to be able to get that, that file. Not the one that are in gems, the one that you specified on the command line. We also have to deal with load path mutations. Like if somebody does this, I've seen this in Ruby code, you might do unshift, require something. Now the other important thing, extremely important thing, is we have to have bundler support for this. If we want to have this particular strategy, because the way that your applications work, if you're using a bundled application like we are at work, when you say bundle exec, rails, whatever, 
that Rails whatever isn't actually using RubyGems anymore. RubyGems is completely out of the picture in that case. So we need to be able to support that case too. Uh, what happens in that case is Bundler sets up the load path for you so you actually have a load path of however big it is and then you scan against that. So it would be nice as if we could integrate this into Bundler as well and then have constant time lookup in that case too. Now, I want to end this. I've been talking for a long time. Sorry. I want to end this with a strange bug. Super strange bug that I ran into while trying to figure this stuff out. All right, we have two files here. A.rb and B.rb and A autoloads B. The same setup we had earlier, but the setup before was like temp and X or something like that, right? Have A here, B there, and if I run this program, I get an error. But what's weird is it printed out high. So clearly, I mean, it's getting into that second file, but it, it just gives me an error. It's weird, right? So <laughs> I couldn't figure this out. I'm looking at this. What is this doing? What is it doing? Why is this breaking? Does my, does my code look wrong to any of you? Is there a bug in this code? Anyone see a bug? Class inside class? No, class inside class is fine. Double colon? Nope. Nope. Is there a bug? Okay. Nobody sees a bug. All right. I get an error. Now, I get on IM with a friend of mine. I'm like, hey, uh, my code is breaking. Can you help me out? I'm trying to run this thing. It just seems like autoload is completely broken. What am I doing wrong? The conversation went a little bit like this. Uh, works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> you must have broken something. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. What file names are you using? What file names are you using? I'm, I'm shortening up this conversation here. And they, they said, well, I'm using, I'm using x.rb and y.rb. <laughs> and I said, try a and b, try a.rb and try b.rb. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there is no bug in my code. What, what it turns out, what actually breaks is if you have a file named b.rb or rb.rb, it won't work. <laughs> Just doesn't work. So the solution is, uh, don't name your files, your files like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's, not, that's not right. That's not right. You should be able to name your file b.rb or rb.rb. It should work fine. But what's interesting is what I, I researched this bug. I dug into the internals of Ruby. I actually fixed this bug. It is a bug in Ruby. It's a bug in Ruby, and I fixed it. Um, but the problem is I think... <laughs> While well, I was working on this bug, I was looking at pairing with somebody, and pairing on fixing it, and we're looking through, pouring through the documentation, because I, three people thought I was doing something wrong, okay? I contacted three of my peers, and they're like, you must be doing it wrong. You must be doing it wrong. <laughs> Auto load works for me, and every one of them, I had to know, no, no, use a.rb and b.rb. So uh, I'm pairing with somebody, and we're reading through, reading through the documentation of auto load, and the example in the documentation of autoload uses a.rb and b.rb. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this situation for quite a while. You know, we fix this, fix this bug together. I think as developers, as developers, 99% of the time we blame ourselves. Like, if you had run that code, if you had had those two files, a.rb and b.rb, and you're running that and you're getting that error, and you're saying, man, what am I doing wrong? I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. And then you go along and you just change the file name, and now it works. I think most of the time you just move on. Everyone's like, well, I, I must have been doing something wrong. I don't know what I was doing before. I don't know, why, I don't know what I was doing before, but now it works. I know you all have said that. <laughs> I know every one of you have said that phrase. <laughs> 
I think we're all, we're all trained to 99% of the time blame ourselves. And the thing is, the reason, the reason that we're trained to do that is because 99% of the time it is our fault. We did, like, <laughs> we did, we did screw something up. That's, I mean, that's really the truth of it. I mean, I know that, I know that personally for myself. 99% of the time I do, I do make mistakes. But I think what's important is when you get errors like that, when you, when you get an error like that, it's really important to take the time to understand why. Why is it giving me that error? I, I know it's a lot of work. Like, I think it's a lot of work to, to look that up. But I think if you, if you do that, if you're always asking why, if you're always asking why, you'll become a better developer once you understand what is the source of this. Because, for example, in this particular case, it turned out to actually be a bug. It was not my fault. This is like the one time. The one time, it was not my fault. But the only way I found that out is because I persisted and looked, looked into this and kept digging and digging. So what I want to encourage everybody to do is take the time to find out. Always be asking why it's doing the thing that it's doing. Take the time to figure out why it's doing that, and maybe you can fix it. And if you don't fix it, if it turns out you are doing something wrong, you've learned something new. So with that, thank you. If we have time for questions, I'll do that. Otherwise, I'm not sure. Something. It is Friday, right? How did you fix the bug? What was the bug? Oh. <laughs> the, the answer, so we have an answer over here that says regular expression, and that's almost, that's almost true. Um, someone else asked me a question while I find the patch for you, because it's really, really, it's really amazing. <laughs> I have a joke about regular expressions if you want to hear it. <laughs> so a programmer had a problem and he solved it with regular expressions and now he has two problems. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's truth. Okay. So that that probably needs to be bigger. Can everyone read that? Is it readable? Okay, so here is the, uh, nope, that's wrong. Hold on, let me do git log. Uh, function, no, 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 no. Come on, Aaron. Ah, there we go. <laughs> File's named B. <laughs> All right, there is the answer right there, that. So I, I'll, explain, I'll explain what the bug is, and it basically boils down to uh, pointers in C. <laughs> so just as bad as regular expressions. Basically what's happening here is there's that, uh, that function there, loaded feature path, uh, basically iterates over everything inside of the hash. So I, I talked earlier about the loaded features array. There's actually a hash that's used as a cache. This iterates through that hash, calling this function, looking at the file names and comparing them to the canonicalized file name. Or is it, no. No, not the canonicalized file name, the short file name. Now what it does is it says, it's trying to take a shortcut here Everything in the loaded features path is a canonicalized file, and the path that we passed in here is actually the short name. It's whatever you pass to require, or whatever you pass to autoload. It's that string. So this particular shortcut, what it's doing is it's trying to say, like, okay, it's trying to tell, did you pass in the full path, or most of the full path? And it says, all right, I'm going to take this key, and I'm going to move the pointer all the way out to the left-hand side of the string, and then I'm going to take yours, move it all the way out, and then I'm going to move over one and check to see if that string is the same. So since pretty much all the files end in RB, and my file name was B, it would walk back one character and compare those two and say, yes, I have a match. Which is why RB.RB would also fail. If you tried to do autoload with RB, it would do that. So basically what this did is it said, okay, only do this speed hack if the file name has a dot in it. So technically, files named .RB.RB will now probably fail too. 
don't do that. <laughs> the other ones will work fine. Other questions? You mentioned load and uh, require and auto load. How about require relative? Ah, uh, yeah. So I didn't mention, I didn't mention require relative. Uh, and that's basically because require relative, all it does is figure out the full file path and send that to require. So it wasn't, I mean, I probably should have put it in here for completeness, but it wasn't interesting to me as far as performance improvements are concerned. Also, I don't particularly like require relative. Should I explain why? Yes. Ah, I'll ask myself questions. <laughs> All right, so I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of require relative, and the reason I'm not a huge fan of that is because it calculates the full file path and basically does a require on that full file path. So that is faster. If you do that, if you do that that's faster, because you're not doing the search of the entire load path. So that's faster. But the downside of it, the thing that you're giving up, is that um, if you change dash i, it won't impact require relative. So let's say, for example, uh, I, I find this technique to be very useful, especially when dealing with legacy code, is let's say you have a file and uh, you need to test it, but you don't, want, you, you don't want to load that file, you want to fake it out. You have a class inside a file that you want to fake, right? What you can do is you can, you can provide a special path with dash i. So let's say you have foo.rb in your main application, but you want to replace foo.rb with your stubs. You can say dash i and provide a foo.rb that has your own stubs in it, and it'll load that instead of the one inside the application. So it's very handy when dealing with legacy code. You can say, I want to replace this one, stub out this one section of my code base. And you can't do that if somebody is using require relative. If they're using require relative, you'll always get that file. So I'm not particularly a huge fan of that. More questions. Come on. I'm not always in Singapore. Please. <laughs> So the question is, um, what if the file system changes, or uh, should we dig around in the load path if we can't look it up in the cache, essentially? Sure. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess the, idea, the reason I wanted to do it on install is because we know at that time we can calculate it at that particular moment. Uh, we could do it. We could do it at runtime too. I just don't know how expensive that is. And probably the problem is like, let's say we have a gem that contains 4,000 files, right? Then we'd have to calculate that cache for all 4,000 files, even though your app probably only requires 100 of them, something like that. So maybe not do it at runtime. Although I don't see why you couldn't. I mean, if we figure, it, if we're able to calculate that cache at gem install time, we could have an option to do it at runtime too. Okay, if not, I have a question for you. Y yes. What day is it today? Friday. Therefore? Friday hug time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everyone, are you happy that it's Friday? Yes. yes. I don't okay. really believe that. No, no, come on. Are you happy that it's Friday? Are you happy that it's Friday? Yes. Come on, we're getting beers soon, please. <laughs> Everyone stand up. I like to do it, so I work at home, I work remotely, I work remotely for five years and I get very lonely when I work at home. So what I do on Friday is I give the internet a hug to say hello. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, every, okay everyone, on the, on the count of three say happy Friday. One, two, three. Happy Friday! <laughs> <laughs>